started. Uh, today we have uh, Sagar uh, Bandari will give us a, a talk about how to see how electrons move around inside quantum material. And uh, Sagar uh, went undergraduate to Trinity College, uh, then became a graduate student up here, and worked in my group for a number of years actually rebuilding our uh, liquid helium cooled scanning probe microscope. Uh, we previously used that to look at electrons moving through a two-dimensional electron gas and gallium arsenide, uh, and it worked very well. But uh, Sagar has redone it so we can look at new quantum materials, things like graphene, where the carriers have no mass and there's no gap and so things are different, and also molly disulfide and some other uh, new materials where uh, people are trying to make new devices. Part of this is exciting because the best devices are made by hand with scotch tape where you're going like this and then cutting up with the EDM lithography. And so the whole idea of how do you develop a, the device physics to actually have a model of how things actually work uh, is an uh, important part of the ingredients. Okay, when so... Uh, Thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction, Bob. Uh, so today I'll be talking about using a scanning gate uh, microscope to image electron motion in uh, two-dimensional materials. And uh, first I would like to mention uh, the collaborators uh, uh, that were involved in giving us uh, these uh, devices that we imaged using our technique. And uh, they were basically Ke Wang and Gil Ho Lee from uh, Philip Kim lab, and Watanabe and Tani Guchi from uh, Japan who were involved in fabricating these uh, uh, boronitride flakes uh, uh, to stack these uh, graphene and MOS2 devices. And uh, Philip Kim uh, was the PI for these postdocs uh, who were involved in making these devices. So the, uh, so the outline of my talk is just shown here. So I'll start with the motivation slide and then I'll talk about the scanning uh, gate technique and then I'll describe our results uh, that we see in uh, imaging magnetic focusing of electrons in graphene, and talk about the results we have in imaging electron motion in MOS2 device, uh, that is, which is uh, more recent, and end with a summary slide. So what is the motivation? Why do we image electron motion? So in a conventional transport measurement, what you do is you apply a voltage to your device, and you measure the current through the device. So the, in this way, you are actually just measuring the bulk property of a device, and you know very little about the local uh, variation in these electronic properties across your sample. For example, if you do a transport measurement in a quantum point contact device, here you can see the top gated quantum point contact on a gallium arsenide device. You see these plateaus of con corresponding to the number of channels going through the point contact. And so that's pretty much it using a transport measurement. But using imaging, you can actually see what is going through this point contact, how these electrons are flowing through the point contact in this uh, gallium arsenide uh, two deck. So that's what we did uh, back in 2000. And the grad graduate student working on that was Mark Topinka in our lab. So he imaged the electron flow coming through the point contact. So figure A corresponds to the first plateau here, which is a single channel of electrons going through the point contact. And figure B corresponds to two channels of electrons coming out of the point contact, and so on. So you can actually see the spatial dependence of this electron flow through the point contact. And if you actually look at these images closely at high resolution, you see these uh, narrow branches coming out as opposed to a spreading smooth like fan, like uh, flow out of the point contact, which was uh, not really expected. And also like, uh, in each of these branches, you see fringes corresponding to the interference of electron waves. And that actually tells us that these electron waves are coherent in nature. And uh, so how does this technique work? How do we image this electron motion uh, using, uh, using our microscope? So we use a nanometer sized tip. Basically, you apply a voltage to the tip. And uh, by applying a voltage, you create a charge density profile on your device, on your two-dimensional material sample. And while you scan this uh, tip at a constant height above the device, you measure the conductance simultaneously. So this charge density that you create using the tip, it deflects the electron paths, and thereby it changes the conductance through the sample. So in this way, you can actually measure the flow of electron to the device. And here on the inset, you see a SCM of the uh, tip. 
So basically using this technique, uh, you use the tip as a localized per movable perturbation. And you can image the flow of electron. So please interrupt me if you have any questions. Like uh, it's OK to ask me questions in the middle while I'm presenting. I, I would be actually happy if you ask me questions. And also, like uh, not just uh, imaging the flow of electron, you can actually image quantum dots uh, using this technique. So here it is like a cartoon of a uh, quantum dot in a one-dimensional nanowire. So this purple uh, uh, circle here denotes the position of the tip. And this is the, so initially at this position, the chemical potential of the dot is not aligned with the source and drain to the left and right of the dot. So there is no conductance. But as you move the tip close to the dot, the chemical potential of the dot changes. And once it, and at some point, it aligns with the source and drain, and you have conductance. And if you move the tip further towards the dot, the chemical potential moves, and then you see no conductance. The conductance is blocked. So if you actually plot the conductance through the dot versus the tip location, you see a peak in conductance at a certain tip position. And if you plot this in two dimensions, you see these uh, rings of conductance peaks around the dot. So these uh, rings are centered around the dot. So looking at the center of these rings, you can find the position of the dot. And also looking at the distance between the dot, by measuring the distance between the rings, you can calculate the size of the dot. So from imaging, you can actually find the size and position of the dot using, the, using this technique. So we use this technique to image a magnetic focusing of electrons in graphene. And uh, we, since we are collaborating with uh, Philip Kim Lab, who is the master of like, making these high mobility graphene devices, uh, we can get like, high quality samples from them. And Gil Ho Lee, a postdoc in his lab, was involved in making these uh, high quality graphene devices for this measurement. So the experimental setup for this uh, uh, for this imaging experiment is uh, shown in the diagram here. So you have a hall bar device. This is a graphene hall bar device. So it's stacked on boron nitride on top and bottom. And uh, just as a standard magnetic focusing measurement, you apply, you inject current through contact one, and you measure the voltage at contact three. So, and you apply a perpendicular magnetic field to this device while you are doing that. So. So basically, by injecting the current and applying a magnetic field, at certain magnetic field, the electrons, they reach contact 3. They focus at contact 3. And uh, there, is a, there is a change in chemical potential at contact 3. And you measure, since you can't have any current injected with, through contact 3, you measure that chem chemical potential directly. And that's how you see the magnetic focusing uh, measurement. That's how we do magnetic focusing measurement. And this, uh, the figure here in the inset is the SCM image of the sample. So in the experiment, what we do is we do the magnetic focusing measurement, the standard transport measurement, while we have a tip on top scanned at a constant height, just like I described earlier. And we hope to see uh, the flow of electrons in this device using this technique. Yes. Uh, that is so that you can improve the contact between the lead and the graphene. So you actually increase the edge contact. Since it is a, yeah, because it is an edge contact, so you are increasing the length of the edge, right, by making fingers. Another question, how do you do the feedback of your tip so you don't crash into the sample? Uh, so the, fee, the tip is actually on a cantilever, piezo-resistive cantilever. So the, uh, you know, the resistance of the cantilever changes when it bends, when it deflects. So by measuring the resistance, you can tell how much the tip is deflected. And the sample is sitting on a piezo tube. Mm -hmm. So the piezo tube, like you can apply a voltage to the piezo tube, so it expands and contracts. So you have like, you know, you know like how much the tip is deflected, how much voltage you need to apply to bring the sample down or up, you know. So that's how you can. Oh, there is no current. I mean, you just, what you do is like the tip is around like 20 nanometers above the sample. So it's capacitively coupled to the device. So the only thing you are doing with the tip is you are creating a charge density dip, or like. You don't monitor it like an STM. No, this is not this is not STM. Yeah. So you are just creating a charge density profile. Yeah. 
So, so what happens to these uh, electrons when you apply a magnetic field? Electrons, uh, they move in circles. They have the cyclotron orbit. So here in this figure, you have electrons injected from uh, origin. And these electrons get focused at uh, twice the cyclotron radius. And if you have two contacts, two point contacts spaced apart at twice the cyclotron radius, you will see a peak in conductance, peak in number of electrons in the if you assume that this is source and this is drain, you will have a peak of conductance at the drain, at the magnetic focusing field. But if you increase the magnetic field by twice as much then, and keep the spacing between the contacts same, you will have a reflection halfway between the uh, two contacts and you will see another peak. So that's the second magnetic focusing peak. Yeah. Uh, minimum mobility. I think like. Uh, so the mobility of this sample was uh, 300k, 300,000. Uh, so the mean free path, I think, corresponds to like maybe 10 microns, more than 10 microns, I think. But so I guess like the mean free path has to be bigger than the spacing between the contacts, right? Or bigger than the cyclotron diameter, so that you can see a signal. We haven't really done like you know measurement on different mobility devices. Yeah, but in theory, like you know, the mean free path has to be bigger than the path of the electron to reach the contact, right? So uh, in transport, we look at the magnetic field dependence of these uh, this voltage developed at contact three that I mentioned earlier. So this is contact three here, and. Uh, so the color scale represents the trans resistance, which is basically the voltage developed at contact three divided by the injected current. So you see a peak here. So in the x-axis, it is the magnetic field. In the y-axis, is the density. And you see a, a first magnetic focusing peak uh, here. And there is another peak here that corresponds to the uh, first, like one bounce uh, at the halfway between the contacts. Uh, so basically, it is shown here in a cartoon. So basically, you have these electrons going directly from top to bottom. That's the first magnetic focusing peak. And you have uh, electrons uh, bouncing off halfway between the contacts and reaching the uh, drain. So that's the second magnetic focusing peak. So what happens uh, to these trajectories when you introduce the tip? So as I mentioned earlier, the tip creates this uh, nice charge density profile on the sample if you apply a voltage to the tip. And this charge density profile, it creates a force that is radiating outward. So the electrons, they feel this force. And uh, this is a ray tracing simulation of the uh, cyclotron trajectories we did using MATLAB. Uh, basically, it is all classical. So you have the electrons have a velocity and the force that we take into account is the Lorentz force from the magnetic field and uh, the force due to the tip. So the electrons, they are injected from the bottom contact and uh, they move in circles. So if there was no tip, these, ele these electron trajectories would reach from bottom contact to the top unhindered. They would like make it like that. But once you introduce the tip, the tip deflects them away because of this force you see here. So there are le fewer number of electrons reaching the top contact because of the tip, whenever the tip is aligned exactly on top of the path of electrons. So you see a decrease in the trans resistance. So you can already think about like what the image would look like if you have electrons going in circles from bottom to top. You should see circles, because that's exactly where the uh, trans resistance would drop, because the tip will deflect the electrons away. And that's what we see here in our experiment we see a nice semicircle connecting the bottom contact to the top contact. And this red region is the drop in trans resistance. That means there are fewer electrons reaching the top due to the tip. So you can actually image the flow of electrons going from bottom to top in this graphene device using this technique. And also you see a blue region here, which is actually enhancement of the trans resistance, which is the, that the tip is actually helping the electrons to reach from the bottom to top. So I'll talk about that later, how that uh, actually happens. And in our sim simulation, we see similar pattern. So the simulation I showed you earlier, that where we just use a classical ray tracing uh, technique, uh, we see this uh, red region of uh, 
the drop in transmission probability of electrons uh, from the bottom contact to the top contact, which shows a nice semi semicircular region, and the blue region, which corresponds to the enhancement of trans resistance or transmission probability of electrons. And we did a series of experiments and looked at the dependence of these, uh, uh, these trajectories that we imaged with magnetic, under, uh, with magnetic field and the number and the charge density and the density of electrons. So along the focusing field, you see these uh, nice uh, trajectories reaching from source to drain. And uh, away from the magnetic focusing field, you see almost nothing. And also, if you look at these images, you see these uh, red region. They are changing spatially with the magnetic field. At lower magnetic field, these uh, red regions are closer to the edge. But as you increase the magnetic field, they move further and further away from the edge. And the blue region, which is the enhancement of the trans resistance, it is far from the edge at lower field. But as you increase the field, it actually gets closer to the edge. So you see similar pattern like across all the density range. And we did uh, the ray tracing simulation also so similar uh, pattern where we have this red region uh, close to the edge at lower field and going away from the edge at higher field, and the blue region is doing the opposite. Yes? Uh, this is the intrinsic, char intrinsic charge density. So you change the charge density here by the back gate. Uh, this is at 4 Kelvin, yeah, I forgot to mention. We haven't done any temperature dependence on this one, yeah. Yes. So, any ideas on why the ray tracing simulation doesn't get that powder blue dark? Uh, I'm not sure. I think. Yeah, I have to think about that. I don't know on top of my head why we don't have that uh, match yeah, right now. So, so if you look at these images at lower field, as I was talking earlier, as I was mentioning earlier, that the red region is close to the edge at lower field. So this can be explained by this like cartoon picture here. So at lower field, your cyclotron diameter is large. So the only trajectories that can make, from, uh, make it from the source to the drain are close to the edge. Because you know, if you have large diameter, and if you just draw circles and then try to connect the two, you know, the two source and drain by the circle, it has to be like close to the edge if it is big. But if the magnetic field is uh, large, then your cyclotron diameter is small. So the trajectories actually have to be far from the contact because the only trajectories that can reach from source to the drain are, have to be far from the contact. And that's exactly what we see in our experiment. And the blue region, so this blue region is at higher magnetic field. You see this blue region close to the edge. So you can imagine this uh, situation where these electrons, uh, since they have a smaller diameter, they are bouncing off the edge. They are bending more, and then they are close to the edge, and they bounce off. And since the edge is kind of rough, because of the way the samples are made, they are made in the, uh, the way they are made uh, into this geometry is by etching them. So the edge is very rough in these devices. So these electrons, they bounce off the edge in random directions. And they cannot reach from source to the drain if they are bouncing off in random direction. But if you introduce your tip exactly in that location, close to the edge, the tip can actually deflect the electrons back into the drain. Since the tip created charge density profile is much smoother than the edge of the device. So you see, uh, and that's why you see this enhancement of the uh, trans resistance close to the edge at lower, at higher field. And uh, at lower field, this blue region is uh, moving away from the edge. It's farther from the edge. And uh, the cyclotron diameter is uh, large at lower field. So these trajectories are like going far from the uh, edge of the sample. And they are not actually reaching the drain normally. 
But if you introduce the tip, the tip can deflect them back to the uh, back to the drain, and you have these blue regions far from the contact, far from the edge, at uh, lower field. So the ray tracing simulation also agrees well with this uh, explanation. So you, this blue tra uh, trajectories, they would actually not make it to the contact if there was no tip. But introducing the tip uh, far from the edge actually deflects them back to the contact. So this is the diagram at uh, higher field at lower field, so it actually increases the trans resistance uh, far from the contact. And this is the simulation result for this uh, particular magnetic field. And at uh, lower field, you have these trajectories bending in towards the edge. And uh, if you position the tip close to the edge, it actually deflects the uh, trajectories back into the drain. And it increases the number of electrons reaching the drain. So the ray tracing simulation also agrees very well with the experimental result. So from that experiment, we have seen that you can use a scanning gate a microscope to actually image electron flow in two-dimensional material like graphene. Even like Bob was mentioning earlier that the electrons in uh, graphene are massless Dirac fermions. And you can actually use this technique to uh, map the flow of electrons uh, in, this, uh, in graphene which is not like similar to other materials. So with uh, the discovery of all these new two-dimensional materials, we thought it would be interesting to see, look at other materials like MOS2 and uh, black phosphorus and all these new 2D materials. And uh, here we present our result on imaging electron motion in um, MOS2. And uh, the interesting thing about MOS2 is like uh, it is a, two-dimensional semiconductor and also the band gap, it depends on strain and also it depends on the number of layers in MOS2. And there are all nice like theoretical predictions about, about MOS2, but uh, people haven't really been able to figure out uh, how to make a high quality MOS2 device, uh, as opposed to graphene where the mobility goes up to 200K. Uh, so using imaging uh, technique, you could actually figure out locally how these uh, electrons are moving and maybe it can give you an idea what exactly is happening in local scale so that it could help people build uh, these devices better with higher mobility. So this MOS2 device was uh, provided by Ke Wang in Philip Kim lab. Uh, it's uh, just like graphene, this is also a Hallbar device. And uh, uh, these, uh, so it's a three layer MOS2 device mm -hmm. stacked uh, with boron nitride on top and bottom. Uh, so these uh, outlines here, the elliptical uh, white uh, outline here, it represents the region that we scan using the scanning gate technique. Uh, so there is a square region here and an elliptical region. And uh, so what we do is we inject a current, we apply a voltage and you measure the current through this device. It's like a two terminal measurement while we scan the tip on top of these regions. And this is the image that we see when we scan in this region. So this uh, image here is a plot of the resistance change through the device as you move the tip across this region. So you see a peak in resistance change centered around this uh, contact. And uh, so basically it shows that the tip is partially blocking the flow of electron uh, at these contacts. So that's, why, that's how it is changing the resistance. So if you plot the spatial dependence of this resistance change uh, into the device, you see a linear, you see exponential decay. So this is a log scale of the resistance change uh, versus the uh, depth into the device. And uh, we see the same, same kind of pattern in different contacts, even in the narrow contacts. So this is for the narrow contact reason. Yes. Uh, this is graphene contact, yeah. And so there is an exponential decay, and uh, the uh, when you measure the when you calculate the characteristic length of this decay, it is 250 nanometer. Uh, but the main free path in the device is 50 nanometers, which is uh, much different than the characteristic characteristic length of the, uh, decay. So. Uh, what we think is that the mean free path uh, from transport comes from the average 
of like the whole device. But the uh, characteristic length we get for this uh, electron flow on the contact is a local information on the device. So maybe it's not really uniform across the device and you're actually just measuring uh, local information and uh, it, it can be different from the bulk measurement. And the uh, next experiment we did was we changed the back gate voltage, we increased the carrier density and saw how this uh, flow pattern changes. Sorry. So as you increase the carrier density, you see the flow and then it disappears. So initially there is no flow. And then as you increase the carrier density, you start seeing the change in resistance and at a certain point it disappears again. So this can be explained by a simple picture where you just have a river with no water in it. So basically the river is dry. So imagine the water like uh, electrons. So you put a stone on the river. So when there, are no, there is no water, you don't really block any water, right? So you don't see any blockage. You don't see any change because there is no water to block. To block. But once you start adding water, then the stone actually starts making difference in the flow of water. It blocks some, something, some water. So you see a change in the flow. But as you in, keep increasing the water level, at a certain point, the water level becomes so high that the stone doesn't really make a difference in the flow. And that's exactly what is happening here. As you keep adding more and more electrons, the effect of the tip is decreasing. But initially, there is no electron there flowing anyway, so you don't see anything. Sorry? Say that again? Uh, we, yeah, we haven't done that yet, yeah. We are just apply a constant voltage on the tip. And if you plot the images in series, so you see like, you know, at lower density, you see nothing. But as you increase the carrier density, you start seeing this uh, block, like the effect of the tip, it actually lowers the resistance. And after a certain point, you see nothing. Yes. Let me see if I have that information. It's like along the transition line. It's not really when it is like conducting well. So it's somewhere in the middle. So there is insulating and there is like conducting, right? So it's along that slope. But I need to get the information on the density. I don't have it now here. Yeah. So the next thing we do is we look at the narrow contact and we uh, scan this region here. So at higher density, like when it is like uh, close to the conducting regime, you see the flow blockage like earlier. But at, as you decrease it, like close to the insulating regime, we see Coulomb blockade like rings close to the contact. So like I showed in my first, uh, I think it was third slide, you actually see quantum dot like behavior close to the contact. So basically what is happening here is uh, these rings, they correspond to the peaks in conductance. So basically whenever your tip is positioned here, it is adding a charge to your dot here. So that's why you see a peak in conductance. The quantum dot is conducting now. There is an electron going through it. So whenever you see a conductance peak, that means the electron, that means the tip is adding one electron to the dot. So you see a, a jump in conductance at that location. And uh, if you use a simple model of uh, capacitance between the tip, so this is the tip model with two spheres, one big and a small, connected with the wire. Uh, and you look at the capacitance between the tip and the dot, which is uh, represented as a C tip dot. And uh, the capacitance between the dot and the back gate, which is C dot back gate. And there is our doped silicon back gate. So using these two capacitance, you can actually calculate the size of the dot. So the equation for the charge induced on the dot, if you just vary the tip position, is charge induced equals to the capacitance of the tip between the tip and the dot multiplied by the voltage at the tip. 
if you keep everything else fixed. So that's the first experiment we do. We keep the back gate fixed and we change the position of the tip in the Im imaging experiment. And the equation uh, we come up with is delta Q. So see in each of those rings, you are adding a charge. So delta Q equals to E is delta C, the change in capacitance as you move the tip, multiplied by the voltage at the tip. And so basically, if you know the capacitance between two spheres, you can come up with this equation. So that equation depends on the dot size, radius of the dot, and radius of the tip. And uh, from there, you can calculate what the size of the dot is. And it turns out to be 180 nanometer. And if you uh, pick a center, center of these rings, and draw a circle of radius 180 nanometer, it turns out to be in this location here. And there is a, so if you plot the a spacing between these rings divided by uh, versus the square of the distance from the tip to the dot, you have a line. And if you just look back uh, at this expression, you have this uh, spacing between the rings and the square of the distance between the tip and the dot. If you plot them against each other, then from the slope of this line, you can calculate the size of the dot, which is also 180 nanometer, just like I mentioned earlier. So there is another way to calculate the size of the dot. So this is uh, basically you change the back gate voltage and look at how the rings move. So you pick a position in this, uh, in this plot and see how the conductance of that position changes as you change the back gate voltage. So basically in this model you have uh, the tip fixed because you are fixing uh, one spot in your image and you just change the back gate voltage. So charge induced here is actually just capacitance between the dot and the back gate multiplied by the change in the back gate voltage. So the expression you get is basically these two capacitance are in series. So you just have a expression of uh, capacitance like one over C1 plus one over C2 because you just add uh, the capacitances in series. And uh, when you plot that uh, change in conductance uh, with the back gate voltage, you see these peaks at that uh, fixed tip position. And uh, using that expression I showed you earlier, you can calculate the size of the dot, which is uh, 200 nanometer. So it's close to what we got before, just keeping the back gate fixed and changing the tip position. And uh, if you look at these images, as you change the back gate voltage, uh, at lower back gate voltage, you see these uh, rings centered around this uh, dot that we uh, looked at earlier. But as you increase the back gate, you start seeing these uh, other uh, rings centered around another dot here. So it looks like there are more than one dots in this uh, contact. So since these dots are not actually purposely made, so it, it is plausible that there are like more than one dots in this contact because of some unknown, I mean, probably because of strain or some other factors. So the summary of my talk uh, is uh, uh, as shown here. So we use the scanning gate microscope uh, technique to image uh, electron motion in graphene. And uh, the ray tracing simulation, uh, it agrees pretty well with the experimental result. And uh, in a MOS2 Hallbar device, uh, we use the SGM to partially block the flow of electrons uh, through the contact. And these, uh, uh, this pattern, it actually decays exponentially uh, from the contact. And also, like at lower densities, you actually see quantum dot formation at these contacts. And using these uh, ring spacing, uh, you can actually calculate the size of the dot and location. And finally, I would like to thank our collaborators, uh, Gil Ho Lee and Ke Wang in Philip Kim Lab, who were involved in uh, fabricating this uh, device. And Anna Klales in uh, Heller Group, who in, was involved in uh, uh, doing the theory and simulation with us. And also the grant uh, 
uh, providing agencies, uh, DOE and Air Force and NSF. And thank you all for coming. Thanks. <laughs> it's kind of short, I guess. Well, thank you for lots of the questions. You have, uh, would you like to know more about how this works? Or? Like some technical questions. Yes. Yeah. How do you get the tip at 20 nanometer above the shelf? So we have we calibrate the piezo tube. So by we we know by how much voltage you apply, how much nanometer you move, right? So first you come into contact with the sample with the tip. So you know that it's zero nanometers, right? Yeah. And then you apply a voltage to the piezo tube and you move a certain amount. And we know that like you know it has it is not exactly like 20 nanometers I mean it should be plus minus like you know five or six nanometers depending on the error in your like voltage source but that's how you do it but at 20 nanometers you turn off the feedback and you, you make yeah we turn off the so feedback it's kind of stable on, on a long time scale right? yeah okay the, before that what we do is the sample is like uh, the plane of the sample is not perfectly flat right I mean it might be tilted at certain like uh, angle so what we do is we scan Con like we do a contact scan, topographical scan on the sample, and we calculate the plane of the device first. And once we get the plane of the device, you lift the tip up, and we, there is a guide mode. Basically, you guide the tip along this plane. So that way, it is actually keeping the distance constant. Uh, what time scale? Uh, can you keep the uh, so the time scale for these measurements were like one day. So it's like 24 hours. It's pretty stable. And we didn't see the image move or like, you know, change over that time period. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I was wondering, do you not have a dielectric between the tip and the electrode? Is that air gap your dielectric? Uh, so right now there is boron nitride, which is uh, 30 nanometers to 50 nanometers. But the, what we are doing here is we are creating a charge on the device by applying a voltage on the tip. So the dielectric might actually enhance the effect of but do you have creating. Dielectric between the air gap as well as the boron nitride, then? Air gap. Uh, what do you mean by air gap? I thought you lifted it by 20 nanometers. Yes, yes. That produces an, a gap, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, but that is vacuum, right? It's all done in vacuum. It's the same kind of thing. Yeah. And you don't modulate the tip distance at all? The tip, you, you treat it in contact mode, you never tap the tip? Uh, no, we don't do the tapping mode. It's always, so first you come into contact, you calculate the thing, you look at how the sample is tilted, right? And you lift the tip up and you guide the tip along this plane, whatever you calculated based on the plane of the sample. Yes. Yeah. But that produces a gap of air, or in your case, a, gap, a vacuum gap, yeah. which is a very nice dielectric. And then your boronitride. Yes. But you treat that as one capacitance. Yeah. The air gap and the boronitride yes. is regarded as one yeah. capacitance factor. Yeah. And what do you do to the tip when you're changing the gate bias? Is it grounded or? Uh, you apply a voltage to the tip, right? So while you vary the gate. Yeah. Yeah, you have a, some bias on the tip. Yeah. While you're sweeping the gate. Yes. Essentially. Mm -hmm. And you have boronitride underneath as well. Yeah, so you have boronitride on top, and then the graphene or MOS2, and then you have boronitride on the bottom. And then there is a silicon oxide. And oh, there you is do silicon have oxide too? Yeah. So you have double gate dielectrics. Yes. But the difference in the dielectric is not so, I mean like, you know, it will change your numbers by maybe like 10 nanometers or something. We did try to include it. It doesn't really make so much of a difference. Yeah, I just wondered how it affected the capacitance between the quantum dot and the back gate or the quantum dot and the tip, having those two kind of mixed dielectrics above and below. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. You just have one layer, uh, I said one layer of MS2. Uh, this is a, a three layer. Three layers. Yeah. Do you, do you, can you play with that and see if you can 
changes, interesting evidence? So you got one model layer from the Oh, we haven't tried one model layer. Do you think it's interesting to have it in a one layer versus three layer? Let's see, I think it becomes both from like indirect to direct, right? Yeah, it's not this side. I don't know, I mean, like, yeah, I haven't thought about that. It's Mobility, uh, I mean, whether there's something that is much smaller than a thing, so you don't have to tell me the micro graph that you mentioned. Yeah, it's like. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, if you just look at this uh, characteristic, characteristic length of the decay, it's like 200 nanometers, right? But in graphene, you see these cyclotron orbits which extend like 3 or 4 microns easily. So there is a big difference in like, imaging. You can monitor it. You see, you see the, the scattering. Yeah. Let's see one uh, last question. These are inter interesting physics. Are there novel device applications? This cracking system. I mean, just it's it's a it's a you know it's, it's a novel physics. Right? So the next question. I think like this. Uh, I don't know about like applying this technique to like do something, but it's mostly like studying materials. So for example, like, you know, people are trying to make this, uh, you know, ballistic, highly ballistic graphene devices. And maybe in future, like, uh, you know, there will be ballistic electronics and you want to know where the electrons are moving in this ballistic electronics before you make them. So you can actually, you know, better like manufacture these devices. And this is a really good tool to actually see where these electrons are flowing. Yeah, non-invasive, exactly. Okay, well, thank uh, Dagar again. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, the speaker for uh, next week uh, is here. Uh, it's Amir Hassan Norbach, and uh, from MIT, uh, and he'll be talking about how you make electronics out of things like MIT. And then finally, the students for the course, here it is. Please uh, sign up uh, down here before you uh, take Thank you. I went pretty quickly, though. <laughs>
So there is not a joint uh, support for the work. It no. is just by, okay, you combine results from different, different projects. And different things. So the imaging was supported by one, by one branding. So you, you yourself are supported by one? Yes. yes. You yourself, yes. not just the activity, but, but your activity, in yeah. not a specific project, but your activity. Yeah. Uh, plus two more, okay. Thank you. Because I saw three of them and said, how? Oh. <laughs> so where are you from in Europe? In Madrid.